Okay, hello folks. Uh, getting started here with another live video from the creek. Uh, we'll wait for more people to join uh, as we get started. Um, I'll give a little bit of a walkthrough of where we are, and then we have a specific topic that I wanted to go through and talk about today uh, about the Superfund process uh, here on Newtown Creek. So my name is Willis Elkins. I'm the executive director of the Newtown Creek Alliance, and uh, thank you all for joining another one of these virtual programs uh, during the current pandemic. So uh, we've got a few people on, but we're going to get started. So uh, I am out um, on the creek at a street end site uh, that we refer to, and I'll just flip folks around here, uh, that we refer to as uh, Penny Bridge. And, um, and Penny Bridge is at the very end of Meeker Avenue in Brooklyn. And so we'll give a little bit of a walk through. And what it is, this is the very end of Meeker, which eventually connects uh, to the BQE, is that this used to be a bridge uh, called Penny Bridge, um, also known as the Meeker Avenue Bridge. And it crossed from Brooklyn to Queens that we see on the other side. And you can still see some of the original, uh, or the last remnants of the bridge that was here uh, with that footing there. Uh, with the stonework and the concrete on top and that's what we're standing on here as well as the brooklyn side so uh, this bridge the last bridge that was here was torn down in 1939 and was replaced by uh well not that one but the bridge before the kajusko uh, which was actually only named the kajusko in 1940 when it was originally built it was known as the new meeker avenue bridge and of course the new kajusko uh, the second span just opened last year uh, and is very different than the old one so uh, this bridge, this was actually uh, the first crossing of the creek in this area from uh, Queens to Brooklyn. And there was a variety of different bridges that stood here at one point. And uh, one of those was a toll bridge that joined, or, uh, that joined the creek and charged a one cent toll, uh, giving the nickname the Penny Bridge. Uh, it was of course a turning bridge uh, that opened uh, to allow for traffic to come through. Um, you see in the back here, we're about halfway into the creek here. Uh, if you were to continue to the east underneath the Kajusko Bridge, uh, you'd have about two miles to go before you hit the end of the creek. And if you were traveling out west here to, uh, towards Manhattan, you'd have about another two miles until you hit the East River. So we're kind of right in the middle of, uh, of the creek here, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. How you doing? We have some folks coming to get some fresh air out here. Um, so please ask questions as we go through. One of the other really important things about uh, the history of this site at Penny Bridge is, um, is about the Greenpoint oil spill. And uh, I'll flip you around here for a sec. And so this was one of the, uh, this was the spot, quote unquote, where the Greenpoint oil spill uh, was essentially discovered in the late 70s. And that happened uh, years after the refineries here in Greenpoint closed. Um, and of course the Greenpoint oil spill was not one single incident, it was the culmination of many years of heavy refining activities, oil production, oil storage, um, on this massive section basically from uh, where the Kajusko Bridge is behind me all the way over towards where the modern day wastewater treatment plant is. So a huge massive area, uh, over 50 acres where there was refineries and oil storage and there was numerous explosions and fires and a lot of mishandling of product and all that stuff seeped into the ground and eventually once it got down into the groundwater uh, the groundwater started carrying it to newtown creek so in 1978 as the story goes there was a uh, coast guard patrol by helicopter and they were flying over the creek and they were over newtown creek and they saw off of this shoreline basically a river of oil coming off into the creek and then once they uh, went to investigate, they noticed that there was this entire plume, as I mentioned, covering 50 acres. Um, and so it's estimated, the Greenpoint oil spill is estimated to be about anywhere from 17 to 30 million gallons of oil. And uh, it's underground. They began investigating and cleaning it up in the uh, early 80s. And then there was a number of lawsuits beginning in 2004, led by residents of Greenpoint, 
uh, Riverkeeper organization based out of the Hudson got very involved. They wrote the first lawsuit. And then eventually the state attorney general's office um, that was headed by Andrew Cuomo at that time filed a lawsuit primarily against ExxonMobil, who was the, the primary uh, responsible party. So I'm showing folks this sign here. Uh, and this is uh, basically indicates that there's an outfall here. And you'll see the permittee name ExxonMobil Refining from 400 Kingsland Avenue. Frank's got his name on there, and uh, it's permitted by the state. So what this means is that the way the oil spill is being cleaned up is that they pull um, oil from underground that's mixed in with the groundwater, and they send it to two separate uh, recovery facilities, and those facilities separate out the oil from the groundwater. And then once the water is clean, it gets discharged to the creek. So that's what this sign is about. It's a permitted discharge point. So this is one of two outfalls. And it's really hard to see, but if you come to this site and you look over the shoreline, you'll see there is a giant stack of rocks and then underneath, you can kind of hear it, there's a pipe kind of hidden away there. And that pipe is discharging clean groundwater from underneath Greenpoint. The oil has been separated out at this point and uh, the oil is actually taken to refineries for, for use uh, and other products. Um, this uh, giant shed that you'll see if you come here at the end of Meeker Avenue is part of that recovery operation. And so it has within it a recovery well. Uh, and this was probably one of the first wells that was installed. Uh, so within this giant facility here, the shed, you'll see RWG for recovery well and G just indicating what it is. And maybe you'll see some equipment in here. But this is one of the wells. This is also an access point, this little uh, cover here, all part of the, the recovery operation of the oil spill. So, let me know if in, to date we got 13 million gallons have been recovered. Uh, they're still pulling oil from underground. Uh, it's a pretty interesting process, but there's a lot of information online. Uh, the state DEC who oversees the cleanup has a really good website. If you just Google Greenpoint oil spill, uh, it should be one of the first things to come up. So, just a little bit of history about this site. So this is a cool little street end working to try and clean this up. It's city owned. Uh, it's technically managed by the Department of Transportation because it's a street end. And uh, so we began doing cleanups here uh, about three years ago. And we have hauled out uh, literally tons of trash. Uh, we also worked with Exxon. They were very generous in bringing in a lot of uh, uh, large power to to get rid of a lot of stuff that was dumped here huge slabs of concrete and all sorts of stuff uh, We pull tires out of the ground and anything you can come up with so it's uh, It's an unofficial access point um, As you can see it's kind of a nice place to uh, Come escape and, and see the water and, and it has this really kind of nice lookout so come check it out Penny Bridge the end of Meeker Avenue uh, definitely be careful if you're coming here it's a heavy industrial area so there is a lot of truck traffic although under the current shutdown there's a lot less than normal uh, but these streets can be a little uh, hazardous to walk down so uh, we're gonna walk over here we got folks hanging out and um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the Superfund process so um, if people have questions please ask um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Superfund uh, for a couple reasons one is that it's one of the most important things happening with Newtown Creek, uh, that we're one of three federal Superfund sites in New York City. And uh, it's really one of the key ways that we're going to clean up uh, the creek and get rid of a lot of the historic toxins that are here. Uh, the other reason is more relevant is that tomorrow night uh, there is online, of course, a uh, Newtown Creek Community Advisory Group meeting. Uh, the Community Advisory Group, also known as the CAG, is the uh, entity that interfaces with uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, as well as the responsible parties uh, and other invested groups uh, to weigh in on behalf of uh, the community concerns. So that includes uh, people like myself that live and work uh, near the creek, that care about it, uh, that want to see it cleaned up, that don't want it to be, uh, you know, this toxic legacy where folks are, you know, it's unsafe to eat the fish or touch the water. So um, uh, that's kind of where we are. So a little bit about uh, the background 
uh, of the creek and the Superfund site. So for those who don't know, a Superfund is a federal designation um, for really contaminated areas. Uh, the legislation began in the early 1980s. And as I mentioned, there's three federal Superfund sites in New York City. Of course, Gowanus Canal is a very well-known sister Superfund site. I'll give you guys a nice little view of the K Bridge there. Um, and so we got our designation in 2010. So almost 10 years, it was the end of 2010. So almost 10 years ago, uh, we were listed on what's called the National Priorities List uh, as a Superfund site, meaning the EPA was gonna take over and oversee a massive cleanup of the toxins here. And Superfund, or the, the legislation, also known as CERCLA, uh, is really about the uh, chemicals, toxins that are uh, posing uh, a hazard to ecological health. So that would be any of the wildlife that's coming back to the area, uh, and as well as human health. Uh, so those are the main sort of things there. Hello. Hey, how are you? <laughs> how are you? Um, so those are the main the main aspects uh, as to why Superfund is, is there, to, to take care of, of really nasty chemical toxins. And we'll talk about that a little bit. It's not about biological stuff like sewage overflow, um, because sewage in itself is a, you know, pathogens are regulated in the Clean Water Act. So with that said, uh, Newtown Creek was designated as a Superfund site because of all the heavy industry, the legacy that was left here. So from things like the oil spill, the copper refineries, the manufactured gas plants, uh, all of a lot of these old industries that are no longer here left this really, really awful legacy. And that's seen in the bottom of the creek. So, uh, you know, fortunately, as things have progressed over the past 20 years with things like the Greenpoint oil spill, we don't have, the creek actually looks physically a lot better. There's no longer seeps on the Greenpoint shoreline where oil is flowing into the water here. If we were standing here 20 years ago, we'd probably see a, a pretty nice sheen of oil uh, every single day. Um, but at the bottom of the creek, the sediments, the, the mud, if you will, that's there at the bottom uh, has contained uh, all of those nasty chemicals that have been, been dumped there, you know, really beginning in the, in the 1850s. So that's the primary focus of the Superfund is to, is to address those toxins. And those toxins, those are really nasty carcinogenic stuff like PCBs and PAHs and heavy metals and dioxins. And if you're exposed to those, say you were eating crabs uh, that you were catching here on the creek or you were going and swimming in the waters here on a regular basis, uh, you would have a likelihood of developing some really you know, life-threatening cancers, either for you or for your children. Um, and so that's, that's really you know, the big issue uh, facing the creek and one of the reasons why you know, we can stand here and look at it, but it's, uh, it's not as safe to, to interact with. Um, so that's a little bit about the background. Uh, I'm going to head over to this spot. Now that the family, I want to give a little social distance for the fa family that was here. And, um, and talk through uh, a few other things about the creek. So one is that um, the way Superfund works uh, in the case of Newtown Creek is that the EPA, the federal government, oversees the cleanup, um, but they work with identified responsible parties, or what are technically known as potentially responsible parties, because it's a very legal process. And those potentially responsible parties, or PRPs, uh, are identified by the EPA as having caused the pollution, either them themselves or the companies that they essentially took over for. So in the case of, say, ExxonMobil, ExxonMobil was not a company in 1900 when most of the oil was being dumped here, uh, but they are the predecessors of Standard Oil that was here back in the day. Same thing, companies like National Grid uh, took over from Brooklyn Union Gas, which was the main operator uh, for a lot of the manufactured gas plants that were here and caused a lot of the pollution. So uh, the EPA identif has identified and is continuing to identify responsible parties. Uh, there are currently, I'm actually, I think, believe there's 17 or 18. EPA just named a new party at, the, at our last CAG meeting. And, um, and so those, those parties are, as I mentioned, a lot of really large uh, companies that are related to the petrochemical industry. Uh, the main companies, or entities rather, that were identified at the beginning of the process uh, were ExxonMobil, BP Oil, Chevron Texaco. All of those three of those have a hand in the Greenpoint oil spill. National Grid, 
Phelps Dodge, which is the old copper refinery that would have been directly behind me on the Queen side here. And then the city of New York. And the reason the city of New York was, is named a responsible party is because of the sewer system. And I mentioned that uh, sewage in itself, pathogens are not regulated under Superfund, but because in New York and other parts of the, of the country and the world, we have combined sewer systems, it means that stuff we flush down our toilets combines uh, with runoff from the streets. And in places, urban places, especially industrial urban places, a lot of that runoff can have chemicals in it. So think about people change, illegally changing their oil on the street or you know, even trucks and cars leaking product. Uh, when it rains, all that stuff's gonna go directly into the water here. Um, and so that, for that reason is why uh, the city of New York is named as a potentially responsible party. Um, so we can get more into that. If folks have any questions, please, uh, please chime in. I'm going to take a second and go and look at some of my uh, my notes here about things to talk about. Um, and I'm just going to set up my phone real quick here because I want to show folks too a couple some maps. Even though uh, we're out on the creek and we're sort of playing around with this digital content, um, I want to use this document. If anyone's ever seen this, this is the Newtown Creek Vision Plan, and it's a report that we authored with Riverkeeper. Uh, back in 2018. And what it is is a 150 page report. It's on our website, NewtownCreekAlliance.org. And uh, go check it out. It's a really fantastic report that has a lot of information about the background of what's happening in the creek. And then the main thing is the, is the visioning. And so as we have a cleanup here in the coming decades with the Superfund process, with the reduction of sewage overflow, uh, we wanted to think about ways that we could actually uh, not just get rid of the pollution, but really improve it for human access, uh, for resiliency for the companies that are here to make sure they're not getting flooded, um, to improve the ecological conditions here, so a lot of habitat restoration. So there's a lot of really cool projects in here that were all generated out of uh, community visioning sessions we held in, in 2017 and even earlier than that. Um, so check it out online if you want, a lot of good information. But I did want to use it because there's some, some good maps in here uh, just to show folks a few things. Uh, this is a really good page about pollution sources and a map that's here of the creek. Let's see if you guys can see this. If you're following online, it's page 41 on the document. And, um, and what it shows is some of the main pollution sources. So you can see the Greenpoint oil spill outlined in this sort of giant purple blob. It shows the combined sewer overflow points, these red dots, um, and, uh, and some of the other major sites as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we are about halfway in the middle of the creek, so we're just about here on the map. Uh, and we'll talk about the importance of this site in relation to the Superfund process as well. But just want to show folks that. Another thing I wanted to show real quick in here, there's a whole section about the Superfund process and about the CAG. Uh, and one of the things is this timeline, and this is already a little outdated because it's from 2018. And so uh, what this is, okay, I got some good questions coming in. I'll get to those in just a sec. This shows the timeline. We got our designation in 2010. We are still in one of the earliest stages uh, known as the remedial investigation of the creek. So it's going to take a very long time until the sediments here are really clean enough uh, as to what we want to see. So all that to say is that we have this process, the community advisory group, and it's a really important way for, for people that care about this waterway, that live or work nearby, that want to see it cleaned up, uh, to voice their opinion. Unfortunately, you know, it's a, it's a long process. It's already been 10 years in. Um, a lot of the stuff can be very technical. Um, but we do have resources. We have a technical advisor. Uh, there's a steering committee. There's a lot of folks that are very invested. So I definitely recommend people check out the meeting tomorrow night. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about more what's on the agenda. Let me go up to a couple of the questions here. Okay, first question. What was the outcome of the pilot where people in neighborhoods near CSOs got stop text messages when it was raining? Okay, thank you for that question, California. Uh, that's a very good question. So the city initiated this project called the WAIT program um, that essentially was trying to curb the impacts of combined sewer overflow. And it was actually based on a, on a pilot that we did uh, about five or six years ago, uh, which had the same sort of idea of sending out text messages or tweets so that 
once we get a certain amount of rain and in places around Newtown Creek, it's really not much. It can be about uh, three tenths of an inch of rain will trigger uh, most CSOs here. And it basically would alert people that you should uh, maybe, you know, wait to take a shower, wait to flush your toilet, wait to do laundry or do the dishes. And um, uh, it's unclear. That's a really good question for the city DEP. They expanded the pilot a few years ago to a few, uh, a few additional neighborhoods. Uh, the original pilot that was um, near Cooper Park in Brooklyn, they did see positive results. So because DEP manages our water supply, they're able to track people that are getting the messages and if they actually use less water when they receive the alerts. So they did notice that in the very first pilot, but I haven't seen any updates uh, from the larger one. We've been really advocating uh, that that pilot needs to be drastically ramped up. It's really great for the city to be able to collect that data and show that there's an impact of people reducing uh, you know, their water consumption during rain events. But it's also, there's no reason why every resident or person working in the city shouldn't know when our sewers are overflowing uh, and, and have, you know, have notifications the same way you would get a notification, you know, when there's a rain, when, when there's flooding on your street or when there's a traffic jam or air pollution, so on and so forth. So th thanks for that question. Uh, next question here, can you talk a bit about the North Brooklyn pipeline? Will that affect the creek at all? That's a really good question from, uh, from Laura. So uh, the North Brooklyn pipeline uh, at this point doesn't seem like it will have a direct impact on Newtown Creek. It will lead to a facility that uh, borders Newtown Creek, which is kind of hard to see from here, but basically behind me um, along Vandervoort Avenue where National Grid's facility is. So, uh, you know, potentially I, there's a lot of concerns uh, with the pipeline in terms of its necessity and investment in fossil fuel industry that's been so destructive for the planet. Uh, the fact that ratepayers here are paying for something that's not actually serving us directly. Um, and, you know, I personally certainly, you know, support a lot of those concerns and, and um, you know, it's, it's really worrisome that, that the way that that project is happening. In terms of relationship to the creek, though, it doesn't, it's not you know, potentially if there's issues with leaks and things like that, it could impact the creek. Uh, certainly truck traffic, that's one of the things, is that there, potentially this pipeline is going to be used as a larger transport system to bring liquefied natural gas through the area. And so there could be a real uptick in truck traffic um, and obviously, you know, construction as well. But it doesn't seem like it's going to have a direct impact, at least at this point, on the waters or the sediments of Newtown Creek, if that answers your question. Um, so thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. Um, one of the things, so some of the other stuff we want to talk about, super fun. We talked about the potentially responsible parties, uh, who they are. I mentioned another of uh, other companies have been named. Uh, I can't recall all those off the top of my head. A lot of other, you know, petroleum companies like Shell Oil. Uh, there's a lot relating to the railroad industry. There's a, uh, a giant rail line for those that are familiar that runs uh, along most of the queen side of the creek you can see the green uh, train cars there uh, so the companies that have operated that over the years have some responsibility as part of superfund um, and and a few other companies uh, maybe someone at home can try to locate on the CAG website the full list of responsible parties and they're still adding more so uh, those parties are going to be, you know, they're responsible for the pollution and therefore they're responsible for uh, paying for the cost, uh, the cleanup of the, of the creek, uh, as well as the investigation. So that's, that's part of the process is that the responsible parties have an active hand in the, uh, in the study of the creek. And so, in fact, a lot of the reports that are generated to understand what the pollution is like here are actually authored by companies that are hired by the responsible parties. And that's something that uh, us on the community advisory group have had a lot of concerns about. Um, you know, how can a responsible party have an active hand in determining their own guilt? Um, so that's something that, that's always kind of been on our radar and we have a lot of concerns about that. So one of the things that I want to mention about, we have this meeting tomorrow night. We have regular meetings about every uh, one or two months. Uh, the CAG is formed, as I mentioned earlier, of a lot of folks from the neighborhood, people that either maybe work at one of the businesses or own one of the businesses uh, that's not a responsible party, uh, and then a lot of folks from the community as well. 
Um, so there's about, I think currently, 30 to 40 people on the CAG. If people are interested in joining, it is open. Um, and it's a very, you know, we try to make it as inclusive, democratic process to have people's voices heard in, in, in the cleanup uh, that's happening here. Um, tomorrow night's meeting, it's gonna be our first digital meeting. Uh, our last meeting was in February before the shutdown. And the main topic is about our proposed, uh, what's called an early action um, on the creek. So as I mentioned earlier, we're still in the, what's known as the remedial investigation phase where they're kind of studying the creek and figuring out what's what here in terms of how, you know, how high are the levels of the contamination? Is the contamination moving? How does it impact human health? How does it impact uh, the ecological health? I see a couple of fish jumping over here in the background. Um, and so they've done those studies, um, but this early action is, is uh, being proposed by the responsible, the main responsible parties group. And it's essentially a, uh, a cleanup of the first two miles. So essentially from where I'm standing, this is two miles from the East River. So from here all the way back uh, to the East River, they would address the, the sediment contamination. So we're gonna hear, we've heard a lot already in the past year about this proposed plan um, from both the EPA and the responsible parties. Uh, the main benefit that we've heard from the EPA is that it would potentially expedite the, the overall cleanup of the, of the creek and, um, and uh, you know, would, would help expedite that timeline and give them more information about uh, logistics of a cleanup here. Uh, the disadvantages, perhaps, of a cleanup here on the creek of the first two miles is that uh, there's a few. One, we don't really understand the, uh, the rationale for it. And um, usually when you do an early action for a cleanup of a site, you're gonna wanna try to find the most contaminated sites or, or areas of, of a, of a con contamination site and deal with those. Uh, the first two miles of the creek, like I said, from here all the way, we got a little, another visitor here, a dog and neighbor. Uh, from here to the East River, is actually the cleanest section of the creek. Um, the heavy, heavy contamination, the large amounts of PCBs and PHs um, that are most hazardous are further into the creek. And the reason is one, because of some of the industries that were located there, but also because of the dynamics of how the waterway functions. And that at this point, we still have influence, not just tidal, but a little bit of current from the East River. So if you were to, uh, dump oh here's a fish jumping if you were to dump some um, and you were near the mouth of the river there's a good chance that that uh, oil would have eventually swept out to the East River and not settled into the bottom uh, into the sediments here however if you're further back into the creek and you dumped oil there um, there's a likely chance that oil just would have <coughs> gone down to the bottom and stayed there to this day and so um, the, the the issue about cleaning up here's some fish jumping again uh, about cleaning up these first two miles is that it's really not the most hazardous part of the creek um, and so on the CAG side we're not entirely clear of what the advantage is of cleaning up uh, essentially the safest part that we really want the, the nasty stuff to be addressed it's also in certain point what uh, how that's going to play into the overall cleanup plan uh, the EPA has not set goals in terms of, say, how much PCB they're going to remove here, how much sediment. Um, and so it seems, um, you know, a, a, an unclear situation of how they would set goals for a smaller portion and that there's a real risk that uh, the responsible parties may clean these first two miles uh, up and then have to re-clean them uh, in about five years when the full cleanup is, uh, plan is identified. So anyways, it, it's, you know, a rather kind of technical <laughs> process, the super fun one in this early action. We're still a little unclear about, uh, but I wanted to make a plug uh, for this meeting tomorrow night so people can, you know, tune in and hear more directly from the EPA. Uh, I'll be giving a small, a very short presentation on behalf of the CAG, uh, outlining some of these concerns that I mentioned and, uh, and check that out. The CAG website, if you just Google Newtown Creek Community Advisory Group, uh, it'll come up. There's a lot of good resources, past meeting notes, 
presentations, things like that for folks that are interested. Um, but that's about it. Are there any other people out there have any questions about Superfund, uh, the Penny Bridge site where we are? We had a couple visitors here, a family, and we had a dog. Oh, Riverkeeper Dog joined. Hello, Batu. Hope you're doing well. Um, uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. But uh, otherwise, um, that's about it for the program today. <laughs> Hi, Riverkeeper Dog. Uh, thank you all for joining. And if there's other parts of the creek uh, that folks want to see in future tours uh, or other topics that you want to have addressed, um, you know, please give a shout. I'm gonna try to get some of these on camera here because there's a uh, there's fish and we've seen these. Uh, these are likely bunker fish or menhaden uh, that are jumping out of the creek. The water today is incredibly murky uh, following uh, yesterday's rainstorm. I think some parts of the city got like two inches of rain. Um, so the water is not very clear uh, because it's filled with combined sewage overflow. So pathogens run off from the street, um, but you can see these fish jumping here, um, which is pretty interesting. One of the things I kind of mentioned about this spot where we're at Oh, and there actually, this is really good in the distance. If anyone can see that, is a great egret flying along the shore, coming towards us. So very cool. So we do have, you know, we have egrets and we have herons and a lot of interesting shorebirds here. Of course, the egrets, they go away for the winter uh, to places down south that are warmer and they come back around this time of year. So for me, that's the first egret I've seen on the creek so far this year, uh, which is a really nice sign. Um, so questions here. When's our, we don't, not really sure when our next tour is. I will say that I mentioned that the last one, uh, my colleague, uh, Lisa Bloodgood and I are working on developing a lot more permanent uh, virtual content, if you will. So stuff that's not just going to be live uh, with me rambling in front of the phone here, uh, but really focused on specific topics. Uh, and in large part, that's going to be designed for uh, some of the schools that we work with. So we have a program right now with two schools in Long Island City that are using our urban ecology curriculum uh, to learn about the creek when they're discussing you know, natural sciences. And so we're going to be developing a lot of that content in the next few months, and that's going to be open not just for the students, but for the general public as well. Um, so, but in terms of these informal tours, it's kind of unclear what our next one will be, but uh, as it's getting nice, we're trying to find, you know, head out, come out here and find uh, spots for people to check out. As I mentioned, this is kind of a cool little area here at Penny Beach. We've already had a few visitors. There's another person with their dog. Uh, it's kind of a, an interesting spot. We did a lot of work to get trash out of here, so if you want to come by and, and pick up some trash or uh, maybe if you know some weeds, you can pull some of the weeds out of here. Um, but yeah, come check it out. And then uh, for Laura has a question here, it would be cool to learn more about the local flora and fauna. For sure, the, we're going to do, as I mentioned, a lot of that permanent programming is going to be focused on that. Uh, we're going to do stuff closer to the water's edge. Um, and especially as it gets warmer and we have more things like egrets coming back and flowers that are starting to bloom, uh, we're going to do a lot more of that content as well. So um, that's about it. Happy to stay on. But uh, thank you all for joining and, uh, you know, hit us up uh, on our Instagram if you have any other questions. Uh, we're happy to answer them. So thank you so much.